Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jason Schaffenbiel welcoming you to the November 2020 West Bend Mutual Insurance webinar. This webinar is on preventing winter slip trip, winter slip and fall injuries. Our presenter today is David Abkemeyer. He's a loss control consultant with Argent out of central Iowa. Just letting you know that I ran into a hiccup here that I will upload the handouts momentarily that for whatever reason, the last file I uploaded got corrupted. And so those will be uploaded, but now I'd like to turn it over to David so he can lead this discussion today. If you do have any questions, please chat them at the in the chat box. And this webinar is being recorded so that anybody can listen to it on playback. And I will send an email out to all the registrants uh, tomorrow when the uh, playback is available. So here is David Abkemeyer. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for your interest in attending today's webinar on preventing winter slip trip fall injuries. Um, as we quickly approach the winter season, and um, I'm sure some of you have likely have already had uh, had a little taste of winter weather dealing with it. So today's objectives um, for the presentation include providing some insight into trends from winter slip fall injury data, provide an understanding of the importance of looking for, removing, and reducing the winter hazards leading to potential slip fall injuries, providing you with a comprehensive overview of best practices for preventing winter slip fall injuries, and then how an effective winter slip fall prevention campaign should really be a goal-oriented effort to improve performance of roles and responsibilities throughout the organization. Let's look at a little statistics and data. The Bureau of Labor Statistics provides annual information on employee injuries, illnesses, and fatalities reported by employers is due to slips, trips, and falls that required at least one day away from work. And then of those 244,000, there were 25,370 injuries requiring days away from work that had a secondary source of snow, ice, or sleet. The BLS has also done a 25-year review of employee demographics and injury, illness, and fatality data from 1992 to, or to 2016, which shows the number of workers aged 55 plus has doubled as people live longer and stay in the workforce. Fatalities for this group has increased 50% while decreasing for younger age groups. The highest rate of injury for this group is slips, trips, and falls. This is a winter slip fall exposure in the workplace. Taking a look at Argent claims data, uh, which we have available for our 10 years uh, since inception as a monoline work comp carrier for uh, division for West Bend Mutual Insurance Company. Um, and, it, and it shows that uh, slips, trips, and falls have been the second most frequent cause of injury. Uh, please note that this data represents medical only and indemnity claims and uh, does not uh, reflect any notice only claims. When we look at claim costs, injuries from all slips, trips, and falls have had the second highest average severity per claim. Then we drew, when we drill down into the Argent slip, trip, fall claims data, uh, we see that the second most frequent cause has been uh, claims involving snow or ice. When we look at Argent claims data for just slip, 
fall on snow ice claims broken down by our eight primary classes of business, we've seen a large majority from our insureds providing medical services, which include skilled nursing, assisted living, home health, and hospitals. When we compare this data to the percentage of total Argent premium by class of business, uh, medical service providers represent the highest percentage of Argent's total premium at 25%. So there's a di direct, although somewhat disproportionate correlation. However, manufacturing represents the second highest percentage of total Argent premium at 19%, um, but ranks sixth most number of claims in comparison to all business classes. And then social services with the second highest frequency of slip fall on snow ice claims um, represents the sixth largest percentage of total Argent premium at 8%. Uh, going back to uh, looking at the aging workforce, when we break down the Argent slip fall on snow ice claims by age group, there is a direct correlation with age and the average severity of claims. So uh, how might this trend translate to the age distribution of your workforce? So what we see overall from the data is that slips, trips, falls, and specifically those due to snow ice is an exposure for many employers, especially medical service providers, and that they can lead to serious injuries that often require time off of work and therefore have a significant impact on your workforce and the related direct and indirect costs to the employer. In addition, the susceptibility for slip, trip, and fall injuries um, and also specifically those due to snow and ice is a significant concern as we've seen an upward trend in the aging workforce. Based on what we know in general about the importance of being proactive when it comes to safety in the workplace, I think we can say with a reasonable amount of certainty that failing to plan is planning to fail. And a key concept I'm hoping you all will take away today when looking at how to prevent winter slip fall injuries. I'm gonna move now into the body of today's topic. And I wanna lead with an important question that is at the very heart of preventing winter slip fall injuries in the workplace. Uh, which is more desirable when it comes to snow ice hazards? To eliminate the hazard or to improve awareness of the hazard? I think we all agree that ultimately it's important to focus on eliminating the hazard to the greatest extent possible. Um, however, I think it's also important to ensure there's good awareness of any residual hazards if and when they are likely to exist. So when we look at the importance of eliminating winter slip fall hazards, we need to focus on the following opportunities prior to the winter season. Also, as much as during the actual snow and ice events themselves, and then all the way through the event and following the season. So during these shoulder seasons, such as right now, um, you know, October, November, and then later on in uh, May or March and uh, April, sometimes even May, particularly in the upper Midwest, it's important to anticipate the potential for early or late season winter events, as well as potential for thaw refreeze hazards. So to start with the best way to eliminate a hazard, a slip, uh, snow ice hazard is to remove the potential for the hazard to be created. Um, since we can't control mother nature, but we can control how much employees are exposed to snow ice hazards. A thorough physical inspection of 
exterior areas related to the potential for wind hazards is important and should be completed prior to the season. Ideally, as early as late spring when issues can typically be addressed over the summer months, especially if they involve uh, work with contractors. Your Argent loss control consultant can assist you with providing a sample inspection form, as well as also assist you with conducting the inspection. However, however I think it's uh, ideally better uh, for these inspections to be performed by someone internally, uh, such as the facilities manager. Other good sources of information that can assist with identifying high risk areas include mapping out specifically where the past winter slip fall injuries have occurred. Also use of employee sur surveys are a great way to get everybody involved in identifying problem areas and opportunities to eliminate potential hazards. So looking at uh, areas that should be looked at, inspected uh, on the inspections, uh, look for and correct include general slip trip fall hazards throughout parking lots, uh, walkways, or stairs that could become hidden or worsened by snow or ice. These hazards are often easily fixed, at least temporarily, until better improvements are possible. Areas of spalling concrete can be patched and significant eleva elevation changes due to cracks or heaving or sinking can be bevel beveled down with a grinder. Uh, the direction of drainage uh, created by downspouts can create significant hazards during thaw refreeze periods. Look for this potential for creating slip fall hazards and opportunities to reroute downspouts away from walkways. Looking for standing water, as well as the signs of low spots in parking lots and walkways will help identify additional potential refreeze hazards. Frozen slush can create an uneven surface, potentially causing a fall. These hazards can require more significant repairs and cost if the source of the water cannot be addressed. So we might need to create barriers to prevent access until correction is possible. Look for signs or potential for ad hoc paths, also known as shortcuts across areas that are not walkways and therefore create a greater potential exposure to snow or ice. In addition, observation of employee behavior or surveys can assist in identifying these areas, which can be resolved through installing paved walkways, or if not, again, creating barriers to prevent access. Look again for damage to gutters, obstructions and areas more susceptible to ice dams that could result in icicles which melt and create ground hazards during thaw and refreeze periods. Potential solutions include roof replacement or repairs, improving insulation, gutter replacement or repair or cleaning, and electrical roof or gutter de-icing systems. Ensure staff utilizing uh, ladders safely, are using ladders safely and or provide proper fall protection when performing any work at heights. Look at lighting of parking lots, walkways, stairs, entrances, and dumpster areas to ensure there's good visibility of any potential hazards. And then finally, look at current mat availability and condition, particularly when needed for significant winter events. And we're gonna talk about mats more in depth later in the presentation. I wanna now provide some best practices 
that you can take away today and evaluate how well your organization is controlling wintertime hazards and opportunities to improve prevention of slip fall injuries. The areas I'm gonna address include roles and responsibilities at all levels of the organization, your snow removal plan, snow removal equipment, ice melt, use of contractors, mats, signage, and training. When looking at roles and responsibilities throughout the organization for winter slip fall prevention, I'd like to promote the idea that they should be integrated into existing programs and functions. In other words, I'm suggesting a standalone program possibly could create additional work and potentially less likely to succeed. And this holds true in general for slip, slip fall prevention. Roles and responsibilities should be integrated into existing functions throughout all levels of the organization, starting with ownership, holding top level management accountable for creating and implementing this integration to include the various levels of management, maintenance, custodial, and frontline workers. The various specific responsibilities that we need to ensure are in place and effectively functioning include who's responsible for assigning responsibilities to various departments, uh, physical assessment and identification and correction of the hazards, routine inspections during winter events and following winter events, the actual snow and ice control removal, maintenance of entrance matting and wet floors, hazard reporting, thorough investigation of slip fall incidents to identify the root cause and corrective actions, and also training on job specific re responsibilities, hazard reporting, wearing proper footwear, etc. So getting into the snow removal plan, um, the overall objectives are from a liability perspective to ensure the safety of public, including pedestrians and drivers. From a workers comp perspective to ensure the safety of employees. And also from a property liability perspective to prevent damage to property and landscape. Planning where to pile the snow is an important part of snow removal and should ensure that it doesn't impede access to the building, uh, doesn't cause damage from melting or flooding, uh, does not obstruct the view of drivers in the lot or driveways, uh, doesn't eliminate primary or required parking areas. A snow removal plan map should be developed to include where snow will be, will be piled. Any hazards should be identified that may cause damage to property or landscaping, may cause damage to snow removal equipment. And these also should be clearly marked on the snow removal map. This is a sample snow removal map, um, just indicating you know where snow will be piled uh, and location of exits, primary entrances, along with handicapped parking spaces, fire hydrants. Um, you can also have designated staggered parking, employee parking areas and other hazards marked on the map. Talk a little bit about the benefits of anti-icing pretreatments. I would suggest considering these. Um, some of the, the benefits include, can help decrease the amount of accumulating snow that will have to be plowed as the snow melts on contact. 
helps to make removal of accumulating snow easier and faster, reducing labor costs due, due to the decreased bonding of the snow on contact. Can reduce the potential for freezing participation on precipitation on uh, surfaces, improving safe usage for pedestrians. Can significantly reduce the amount of de-icer required post-event by up to 90%. Um, this is according uh, to research by uh, the Minnesota Parking Lot and Sidewalk Winter Maintenance Manual. Note that use of pretreatments do have their limitations and precautions with regards to effective temperatures and fo forecasted snowfall amounts. They can also be washed away by rain, become ineffective, and as well become a slip fall hazard if uh, too much is used. The actual plan for when snow will be removed should be based on as clear and objective criteria as possible, such as times of the day when access by employees and the public is needed. Um, ideally, it should indicate snow is um, plowed when accumulated no more than one inch. Uh, when you see tire tracks and or uh, footprint shoe prints, the expectation should be that snow is removed down to the bare pavement. It is critical to ensure snow is cleared just prior to shift changes. Removing snow uh, before the temperature drops can help uh, improve the ease of removing the snow as well as uh, avoid any potential for uh, thaw refreeze hazards to develop. Priority of snow removal should be uh, initially main entrances, accessible walkways and parking, primary sidewalks and, light and lot areas, also fire lanes and fire hydrants. And then secondary parking lots, walkways, entrances, and other lower use areas. Also ensure adequate attention is paid towards high risk areas which uh, should be indicated on your snow removal map. Adequate removal of snow ice accumulation between cars that occurs during winter events can be quite challenging and presents a significant slip fall hazard when getting in and out of vehicles. Uh, the best way to address this is to plan for staggered parking during and following winter events, which will then allow for more thorough removal of snow and or ice. Other important areas to ensure your snow removal plan addresses includes uh, for dumpster areas, identify the normal or potential paths for employees to take garbage to the dumpster. Consider trying to limit this to one route that's uh, as short a route as possible. Uh, what condition is the pavement leading up to the dumpster uh, due to wear from uh, garbage removal vehicles uh, and also potential for thaw and refreeze hazards? Consider providing covered smoking areas. For entrances, are they covered? What is the potential for thaw refreeze hazards from gutters or downspouts? Special attention should be paid to employee entrances prior to shift changes. Also provide containers for salt at entrances when needed, but this should not be a substitute for your primary salting efforts. And again, for shortcuts, consider creating barriers if they cannot be corrected. Again, clearing uh, to bare pavement should be the gold standard due to the fact any amount of snow, slush, or ice will be a potential slip fall hazard. 
So there's two pictures on this slide of two lots and they happen to be in the same town, just a couple minutes apart. And the owner of the lot on the right said that they could not find someone who would be able to remove snow down to the bare pavement. However, the store on the left clearly was able to find somebody. The ability of plows to remove snow next to very close to curbs may be limited to avoid damage to the plow equipment and or the, the curb. Uh, this results in creating a, a hidden trip or fall hazard. So somebody does need to be responsible uh, for clearing this potentially hazardous area. Completing inspections of all lots, parking, walkways, and entrances is a critical element of your snow ice removal plan. It holds people accountable for the quality of ice and snow removal. And then as they say, what gets documented gets done. So we would highly recommend utilizing a log for uh, written documentation of inspections. Assign responsibility and ensure accountability uh, for completing inspections to the appropriate personnel and make sure that they receive the proper training on the process. Ensure inspections are completed prior to shift changes and make sure that there's enough time to allow for proper snow ice removal. So also uh, shown on this slide is a copy of the uh, Argent sample snow ice inspection log and this should be included in your documents and your files. So let's talk about equipment, snow removal equipment now uh, for your snow removal plan. And um, on the right, I think this is a very creative and res resourceful idea. However, this is probably not adequate for, for your snow re removal needs. So ensure that equipment for snow removal is adequate for the size and the potential frequency of your snow removal needs. Make sure that it's, it is in good operating condition uh, well prior to the anticipated start of the season. Uh, make sure the equipment minimizes manual shoveling as much as possible and that the equipment is maintained according to the manufacturer's recommendations to optimize its performance in life. Ensure your facilities personnel prepares all equipment ahead of the season, including vehicles, plow blades, brushes, salt spreaders, snow throwers, shovels, and any pre-treatment equipment. Make sure that equipment is maintained again according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Ensure that vehicle batteries are fresh and healthy for the increased demands of the equipment. And it's also equally important to ensure operators of all equipment are adequately trained. Consider a power, a power broom, uh, which can be an efficient and effective option for light to medium accumulations of snow. Also, there's a handheld uh, power broom that might be a good temporary option for between vehicles until the vehicles can be moved. Again, we wanna try and minimize uh, the manual shoveling as much as possible, but sometimes it's still needed. And uh, there's a wide variety of different types of shovels on the market. I think a plow type shovel is better ergonomically than a scooping uh, where you have to lift the, sh the snow more, more frequently, uh, but that might not always work. So choose the best shovel for the job. A little sidebar on ergonomics injury prevention when shoveling snow manually. Keys to preventing injuries 
from shoveling include utilizing ergonomically designed shovels that can reduce the stresses on the body. There's a lot more uh, ergonomically designed shovels on the market now. Keeping the load uh, close to the body. Turn your feet rather than twisting like we always talk about as far as uh, preventing lifting injuries, especially when you have the loaded shovel. Avoid overloading the shovel or also lifting heavy wet snow. And then uh, try not to shovel too much at one time. Tape brakes when needed to avoid overexertion. Let's now talk about ice melt. There are different ice melt products available that have varying applications, effectiveness, potential damage to the surface and surroundings, as well as cost. Ensure the snow removal budget is adequate for the anticipated salt supply needs. I think it's better to have an oversupply that you can then carry over the extra to the following year rather than run short, especially during the thaw refreeze periods at the end of the season. I know 2018 was a particularly harsh winter and I think everybody was running short on salt that year. You can also use sand as a backup, which may be uh, necessary uh, during very cold periods when salt might not be effective. Apply salt according to the manufacturer's guidelines to maximize effectiveness and supply. Sometimes too much snow uh, will limit the effectiveness, so make sure you remove the, the snow uh, as much as possible prior to applying salt or ice melt. Prevent tracking of excess um, ice melt products inside, which can cause uh, potential damage to the indoor surfaces. Um, we also have available in your files a copy of our resource on choosing the right ice melt. Some of you may be dealing with outsourcing some or all of your snow removal. So when transferring this to a contractor, it's important that you obtain a signed written contract. The contract should be specific as possible and ensure that they come prior to shift changes, that the expectation is they will remove snow down to the bare pavement, that it specifies the threshold for when they will come plow. And again, ideally no more, no greater than one inch. Clearly, indicates if they will be salting and or sanding. Also ensure the contract allows you to request additional service for things like drifting snow. Provide the contractor with a copy of the snow removal map that hopefully you've done, completed, indicating where to pile the snow, where the priority high risk areas are, um, the hazards as well as the staggered parking plan. Use a log to provide written documentation of snow removal and salting by the contractor to ensure they are meeting service commitments. Um, this is a sample snow ice control log um, for a contractor, which is also included in your file materials. Um, let's talk about when the problem gets inside. So we're going to talk about walk-off mats now. And the purpose of walk-off mats is to control melting snow or ice that is tracked inside from outdoors that may pose an additional slip fall hazard inside. When looking at mats, we need to consider the various types and applications, your uh, needed length and maintenance.
So generally, there are three types of mats, scraper mat, a wiper slash scraper mat, and a wiper mat. A scraper mat is generally used outside of entrances, and the purpose is to knock off the larger amounts of snow, ice, it's salt and other debris from the footwear before going inside. A wiper scraper mat is typically used either outside the entrance or just inside in a vestibule. Can be used as a primary or secondary mat and combines the functions of both the scraper mat um, to remove snow ice and salt, as well as uh, wiping off some of the residual contaminant and wetness from footwear. And then finally, a, a wiper or walk-off mat, as it's sometimes called, should be kind of the last line of defense in the matting system. And the, the primary purpose is to capture the remaining contaminants and wetness from the footwear. So here's a nice kind of little diagram that shows various mat configurations using the different types of mats and you know how they apply to uh, different conditions. Let's talk about walk walk off mat or matting length. Uh, this is typically uh, specific to walk-off mats, so the ones that are inside. In general, these mats will capture the majority of contaminants that are left on the footwear. Within 10 to 12 average st strides, your average adult stride is about three feet. Um, so that, that translates to about 36 feet uh, length of walk-off matting, which um, sounds like a lot, and actually, in reality, it is a lot, but that in, is also the amount, you know, that typically they we see needed to, to get the footwear dry. So as a rule of thumb, if you see material being, or, or wet footprints being tracked into your facility, uh, it's a good sign there's insufficient length of entrance matting or that the matting requires some maintenance, some cleaning. It's important uh, as far as assigning responsibility for inspection and maintenance of matting, and yeah, that's a cri that's critical to uh, to their effectiveness. The more severe the conditions, the more frequent need for inspection and maintenance. Um, this may inspections may be required multiple times a day, depending on the severity of of the event. Ensure that you have backup or replacement mats. Uh, again, ensure that they are the adequate type and length, and always follow the manufacturer's guidelines for maintenance. Mat inspections should also look for the mats to become a trip fall hazard as a result of rippling or buckling, cracks or curled up edges, uh, flipped over sections, or migration, um, you kind of get what you pay for as, as far as mats. A, a mat uh, that's higher quality is gonna be more expensive, but it typically will be less likely to become a trip hazard due to the conditions indicated above. Also related to the slip fall hazards indoors is signage. Um, should be used for maintenance of wet floors that are typically more of a potential for the indoor slip fall during winter time. Wet floor signage should be used to alert pedestrians of the slip fall hazard. Um, they should only be placed um, when there actually is a hazard. So they should be removed when, when they're dry. So we need to ensure there is assigned responsibility 
for prompt cleanup uh, response, as well as removal of the signage. Ensure that there is an adequate amount of signage and they should be stored near the high risk areas. So very accessible, it's less likely uh, for personnel to go long distances to get wet floor signage. They make a wide variety of uh, wet floor signs. In general, they should adhere to the use of the primary colors of indoor warning signage, which is uh, yellow with black and red wording. Um, so in my opinion, the one on the left is, is not adhering to that and less visible. At a minimum, signage should be at least two feet tall. Uh, I think taller is better, such as the one on the right. Um, this also has some really nice features, such as the built-in dolly for moving it, um, the flashing warning light on top, if you can't tell. Uh, it also has a built-in fan. Um, the middle option is very compact and easy to store with a stable tripod design. So less likely to fall over like your traditional A-frame style uh, wet floor sign. Now let's talk about training. Uh, it's a key component to winter slip fall prevention. Ensure there's thorough training in place for snow removal processes, inspections of lots and walkways, reporting process for reporting winter hazards, corrective action of those hazards, post-incident investigation for uh, winter slip fall incidents, indoor floor and mat maintenance, use of designated walkways, proper footwear, the staggered parking plan, and in general, the winter hazard awareness. Footwear contributes to the potential for slipping on snow or ice. Uh, em employees should be educated to wear boots between the car and the building, especially during winter events. Um, ideally, bring the extra pair of work shoes or keep a pair at work. It's also a good idea to provide a dedicated bench or chair for changing from boots into their indoor footwear um, because sitting to do this process is then safer than standing and trying to do it. For employees who work outdoors during the winter time, uh, again, ensure that they are wearing appropriate footwear for the conditions. Additional over the shoe devices that improve traction are available from a variety of different companies. Uh, two companies that we really like are winterwalking.com. They offer a, a wide variety of products for different applications, such as one that's actually specific, specifically designed for driving, as well as uh, safe for walking indoors. And that's the one that's pictured on the bottom. And then Due North is another company that offers good traction uh, over the shoe devices. If clearing snow off of roofs is required, very import, important that proper fall protection is provided. Um, I think ideally consider safer alternative methods or outside, outsourcing this if necessary. Also, if anybody's up on the roof, um, you know, dealing with anything as far as like mechanicals, ensure that skylights are guarded as they can be uh, very uh, difficult to see hidden on snow covered roofs. Many organizations, those um, in the trucking, transportation, social services, home health, uh, 
contractors and municipal municipalities industries have employees who are exposed to snow and ice hazards that can be very difficult to control. We just don't have as much control as we do, um, you know, internally. So special attention may be needed uh, toward employees to ensure uh, in those industries that they maintain three points of contact when getting in and out of vehicles, uh, such as tractors, keeping steps and climbing surfaces on vehicles clean of snow and ice. Um, wearing proper footwear, very important. And to generally be more aware of potential hazards, uh, such as uh, going from their car to a client's home where, you know, typically the snow and ice may not be very well, if at all, uh, cleared. An effective approach to wintertime safety and preventing slip fall injuries is a campaign that gets everybody involved. The key to a successful campaign, in my opinion, is to establish goals that are objective, measurable, and achievable. So consider setting objective, measurable, and achievable goals related to slip fall prevention uh, that focus on winter slip fall prevention, focus on uh, identifying and correcting hazards from preseason uh, inspections, completing snow ice inspection logs during the winter events or after winter events, um, utilizing the reporting system for, for reporting wintertime hazards, completing routine and timely mat inspection and floor maintenance, um, wearing proper footwear. And also you could use customer or employee satisfaction surveys related to the quality of, of snow ice removal. So the, those are just some, some ideas. Ensure your campaign is visible. Communicating about the campaign goals and updating progress. Ensure there's a good winter slip fall prevention awareness through potentially the use of posters or window clings, table tents, paycheck stuffers, mass texts or email blasts or just some of the few ideas. Uh, some other examples include a nursing home that uh, Improved awareness and utilization of the designated walkway from the lot to the employee entrance uh, by painting it safety yellow and then educating employees to follow the yellow brick road. And I also uh, know there was a school district that had their shop students make four foot high penguins out of plywood and place them out at entrances during winter events as a reminder of potential hazards. Ensure winter slip fall awareness material, materials are changed up from time to time. Keep it fresh. Place materials where it makes sense, such as the employee exits, and don't hide them behind all the other uh, things that might be hanging up in employee break rooms. Also consider maybe hanging them in unusual places where they may have more of an impact because they're unexpected. Um, ensure that you take down the materials, the, the winter slip fall hazard awareness materials when it clearly does not apply anymore, uh, such as the middle of July. At the bottom here is our microsite uh, address for our winter slip fall prevention um, microsite. It has a number of resources, such as a lot that you're receiving today in, in your files. Um, such as the checklist, there's actually, yeah, I think it is in there, the, the key elements uh, to winter slip fall prevention, um, also the inspection logs, but also there's on the microsite thumbnails of all of our winter posters and the window clings we have available, as well as uh, salt shaker stickers um, 
with a link to order those materials. And then there's also information on the attachable traction devices that we mentioned already, as well as um, where to order uh, shaker containers. Speaking of shaker containers, getting everybody involved, um, be creative with ways to get buy-in and everybody um, on board. A drive for con containers, for salt shaker containers that can be filled with rock salt and used um, for work and or at home. Hold a contest for creating the best winter slip fall slogan or poster. Uh, consider incentivizing your programs. A uh, variety of different ways you could do that with a winter party. Um, I don't think we'd maybe see as much done over the winter. We just kind of get through it and we save all the fun stuff for spring, summer, fall. Um, you know, maybe a winter beverage bar, non-alcoholic, of course, if it's at work. Um, winter certificates for, or gift certificates for winter activities, company swag. And I think that uh, simple verbal recognition really goes a long way. So to kind of tie things up at this point, the primary message today is that creating a safe environment for both employees and customers of your organization um, can be more challenging during the winter time. Uh, and it requires everyone in the organization be held accountable for, for their roles and responsibilities. So if you wanna increase your liability for wintertime exposures, don't assign and train on roles and responsibilities for everyone. Uh, don't look for potential hazards prior to the winter season. Don't correct identified hazards. Don't have a written snow removal plan. Don't ensure the snow removal plan is followed. Don't ensure snow ice is controlled to the greatest extent possible. And don't inspect for hazards during and after winter events. And then again, finally to emphasize, how well have you planned to prevent winter slip falls based on what we've covered today? And what opportunities still exist, even though you know snow is just right around the corner uh, before it, uh, the winter season is here to stay for at least a while. So that concludes my presentation today. Um, thank you very much for your time. And now I'll answer any questions you might have. At this moment, we haven't gotten any questions chatted to us that we haven't answered in the chat. Um, David talked about the Argent West Bend Mutual Insurance resources. They're available at uh, the website provided in the chat probably 10 minutes ago. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, chat them and we will answer them. If you don't have questions, we appreciate your attention today and your participation in this webinar. And I'll hold on for about seven, eight seconds to see if there are any questions. <laughs>